Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Move Forward Anyway podcast, featuring dream accelerating inspiration. I'm Jeff Meyer, your host, author, entrepreneur, and coach. My goal with this podcast is to help you identify and clarify your own dream by taking wisdom from others' successes and challenges. If you're looking to take action on your dream, to make a difference doing something you love, but your fears are holding you back, then this podcast is for you. If you're interested in finding additional support, you can also check out my Dream Accelerator coaching program designed to help realize your full potential and reshape your future. As always, you can learn more about my Dream Accelerator program at jeffmeyer.org. Using my Dream Accelerating Formula, heart-centered entrepreneurs can focus on their dream, name their fears, change their mindset, define their next, and move forward anyway. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Move Forward Anyway podcast. I'm Jeff Meyer, your host, and very excited uh, to be with these two lovely ladies, sisters from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who went after a dream, risked everything to start Roots, not the band, uh, but something else m- way better than the band. All right, you guys, enough of that silliness. Please introduce yourself to the audience. I'm so grateful that you're here today. Well, my name is Heidi Latch, and my sister Hillary DeVries and I uh, opened Roots Coffee Bar in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, like you said. Um, I am the older sister between the two of us, and I have a, I'm married with a husband and two kids that are um, 18 and 19 years old and have been with Hillary in business for over 10 years. Um, like she said, I'm Hillary. I um, am also married to my awesome husband, Caleb, and we have two boys, Jude and Cash. And um yeah, we started um, this dream of ours about 10, 10 and a half years ago, and um, we're still sisters, still friends, so it's, it's a good sign. Oh, I can't wait to get in. I can't wait to get into that in just a moment. That's so great. So the, the coffee bar opened 10 years ago. Yeah. When? Mm-hmm. Tell us about, okay, tell us about those first conversations of the genesis of this dream, what sparked it? So growing up, we would go on um, different family vacations and there was a specific family vacation that we went on over 20 years ago. Um, Honestly, I mean, Hillary was probably in like eighth grade at the time. And we went to this coffee shop um, in Florida. I think it was in Florida, Mm -hmm. right? And um, it was big enough for our entire family to fit, which was, which was a great thing because we don't always find something that all seven of our family members could, could sit in comfortably. And we didn't feel like we were taking over. Um, and it had a really cool vibe. It had music, it had um, live, um, live music, but then also had different artists um, have their um, artwork up. The yeah. owners were really passionate. They were there all the time. It was a really, just a really neat um, feeling. Mm -hmm. You walked in and you just felt like the love that they had for the space and the love that they had for the community. And it was just like a moment that we just never really forgot. And, um, you know, fast forward then a little bit. I went to school um, at Luther College in Iowa and got my sociology degree and um, graduated in 2008. At the same time, Heidi also graduated that same year in business management and ended up coming back home to my hometown of Oconomowoc and was kind of left. I thought I was going to be doing the Peace Corps. I was actually um, in the application process of doing the Peace Corps. And unfortunately, that was the moment um, of that summer of 2008 that our parents sat us down and said that our dad had ALS, Lou Lou Gehrig's disease, and he had about two and a half years left to live, they were predicting. And we were, I was at the point where there's no way I can leave for the Peace Corps at this time. I need to stay by my family and figure out what I'm going to do with this sociology degree in Oconomowoc. And um, I ended up getting a job at a local coffee shop and managed it and just absolutely, of course, loved the coffee industry. Um, 
And that was kind of what sparked our conversation. Heidi became my instant best friend <laughs> here. Um, and, you know, what are we, what are we going to do? What are we going to do here in Oconomowoc? Yeah. We never really felt settled. Like I had a full-time job. She was managing full-time at a coffee shop, but still never felt like we were settled in our career or in our spot in life, you know? And mm. so Sunday we would get together at my parents' house. It was a normal thing. We would all get together on Sundays and it would always come up, Hillary and I talking about like, it'd be really cool to open a coffee shop. It'd be really neat if we would someday, someday we're going to open a coffee shop. Someday we're going to do this. And um, mm. I think that's where it all started. And then mm -hmm. I, I think it always was probably, it was probably going to stay a dream. However, um, our parents, they, they kind of pushed us and said, what are you waiting for? Like, what, what's the worst that could happen? You fail. Okay. Then you start over. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for both of us, that was like, okay, that not only would they be proud of us if we just try, but then mm -hmm. it kind of gave us that, that feeling that what, what is the worst that could happen? What is, if we, if we fail, we fail. And then, and then what, then we'll just get a job, you know, I mean, it's okay. You know, at least we tried. Yeah. Our parents have always had that amazing kind of outlook of, you know, you can't take anything here with you. You know, you're going to be eventually going to an amazing place someday, you know, whether you do really, really good and you still can't take it with you or you do really, really bad. You can't take it with you, you know? So what's the worst that could happen? And, and with um, our dad's diagnosis, it just put another light into well, we might as well do this now because life instead of life is short, you never know what's going to be presented to you. So, yeah, I guess that's how it kind of yeah, felt. started. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, first of all, I'm sorry for your dad's um, diagnosis and uh, for that journey. That is, that's such a sad disease. Um, and it's yeah. just, yeah, we, we've had a couple losses of people that have had ALS and, um, I'm sure your heart is for those who suffer from that families that mm. suffer from that as well. Um, when did, when did someday become today? What was the, yeah, so that, what was the final yeah. spark? Yeah, I, I definitely. I think for both of us, because we always want to, we always have wanted to and continue to want to make our parents proud of us. Mm -hmm. So when they told us that, that what are you waiting for? Why, why wouldn't you mm. do it now? Then we started having those more serious conversations. We would even say like, okay, we're going to have a meeting, like an actual meeting, even though we were, you know, I was 25 at the time. <laughs> yeah. And we were like always hanging out, but then there's like, well, Wednesday's going to be a meeting. We're going to actually have a meeting. We're going to like have, we're going to start making out a business plan. So um, I think though, that first spark was really our parents pushing us saying, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're waiting for. Stop talking about it and just do it. Mm -hmm. So then we're like, okay, then we better that. do it now. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So you you love the coffee industry. Um, Roots has more. I'm assuming. And tell us about the mission of Roots. More than just uh, having a good cup of coffee. There's there's a whole bunch. Knowing the two of you, there's a whole bunch underneath that. There's a heart underneath that. Talk to me about that heart centered um, entrepreneurial dream of Roots. Yeah, I think for, for both of us, I guess I can say a couple of things. Um, first, I'd say that, you know, when we, we got that first initial push from our parents, it was um, probably a good year and a half before we even were able to like secure a spot and secure financing. And, and I think that um, that timing worked out so well because our dad was able to be there when we were doing the build out, when we were um, uh, having our first first few days, our first month. And so it was a really, um, to me, I think really important because his heart is in it. His heart is there. We know it and we, we can feel that and we can feel that he is so mm -hmm. present in what we're doing. But um, I think that those first few, those, that first year was just literally us um, trying to figure out what we were doing. And, and so we go to these different places, like I had said, and and we knew then we needed a place for the community to be able to, to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the space was really um, what we needed. You know, we looked at tons of different places and financially, mm -hmm. the smaller the place, the better mm -hmm. looking on paper, you wouldn't yeah, need right. nearly as much as equipment and, and um, 
furniture and even just the square footage for rent would have been better. But we knew we wanted a space big enough so any big group like our family could go in, feel comfortable and not feel like you're intruding or taking over the place. And, you know, we see a lot of that big groups, small groups, um, you know, they have still enough privacy. We wanted a space big enough to feel like a little small community inside. <laughs> we wanted people to feel, we wanted them to feel comfortable. We want them to feel included. Um, but then also that they would feel like they can connect with people like face to face, you know, um, obviously we know that that just doesn't, as the years goes on, even 10 years ago, that, that happened more than it does now, but it is, it is such a, um, such a blessing to, to walk in and see people, especially around the holidays when we see people come in and they get to just connect and sit and hang. I mean, it is, it is truly exactly why we wanted to open, to be able to have this, this community, the sense of community for people to be able to come and just feel so welcome. Mm -hmm. It's neat to hear people, and that was their first date. Now they're married, um, <laughs> or have had a, had a very serious conversation with their family that it was held there. Um, you know, you hear lots of different stories. Or this is you're the only people I really see every day, uh, and and I really enjoy it because I'm just behind a desk all day. And it's really neat mm -hmm. to hear everybody's. Um, different interactions, but I think our main mission and purpose was to create a sense of community and a place to connect for people. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you've done that. Mm -hmm. Sounds like yeah. you've done that. I love those stories of, especially the one that especially grabbed my attention was that families talk about a, they had a hard conversation there. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting to me. So why there? Well, I think it maybe because it was a safe place, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think, and it's not so serious there either. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's it's very lively. It's it can be loud at times, um, but they felt comfortable enough to have um, these conversations there, mm -hmm. and I think that is. You know, and maybe with the coffee, there's a little <laughs> love in the coffee. I don't know, but there is a little <laughs> love in the coffee. <laughs> oh man! So every journey in risking something and going forward with a dream, like you have done with Roots, um, encounters fear. It encounters hesitancy. It encounters doubt or discouragement or despair, even or um, defeat. Um, some of the things we talk about in our Dream Accelerator program um, and helping people analyze which one they get tripped up by. Talk to me about some of the fears that you guys faced when you finally decided, big gulp, big deep breath, to go for it. And you signed the lease or whatever that big moment was that you invested both feet, all four feet into this <laughs> venture. Tell me some of the fears that you experienced, some of the hesitancy yeah. that you encountered. Yeah, well, um, especially in 2000, so we opened in 2011. And at that time, it was, um, there was a lot of vacancy downtown Oconomowoc. Um, and so that was a big fear, um, first and foremost, of mm -hmm. going into a community that um, one, we care so much about because we're from there and born and raised there. Um, but, you know, okay, why isn't anybody here yet? They went through a horrible road construction and, 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 and unfortunately a lot of businesses had to go out, but okay, is this a good idea to do it now then, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, but also being from our hometown, that's another um, fear that like, okay, if we mess up, Everybody's going to know. <laughs> the people that we know are going to know that we just failed, mm. you know? So that was a, a, another kind of thing that we had to gulp. But um, I think our interactions with the bank too, I yeah. think was very fearful. Um, yeah. I would say, I mean, I would say for sure fear, the feeling of um, failure for sure. But then also that, you know, anytime you would tell anybody like, Hey, so we're thinking of, we're doing this or we're, you know, I, I think there was some, some people I just chose not to tell until we were actually yeah. open because yeah. you, you know, their interaction, they're looking at you like, Hmm, not sure that's a good idea. Or like, I don't know that I would do that. Or, you know, are you, are you sure? Yeah. Right. Right. You sure you want to uh, do that? Right. 
now. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so I feel like you get a lot of that. And then you start internalizing that and thinking like, gosh, are we making a horrible choice? So all these different thoughts go through your head. But, and then when the bank, you know, so when we went into this, we, you know, we went, um, met with the bank multiple times and we were told no so many times, like over and over. We didn't, we, we didn't have money to put down. We didn't, you know, uh, restaurants generally don't have a huge, a great track record. So um, it's hard to get um, any kind of lending. Um, we, I mean, we just never really heard no. We just heard not yet. So we just kept going and saying, like, what, do you, what else do you need? So what if we give you this? What if our parents co-sign? What if, what else can we get from to be able to make this doable. So, and we even, even to the point where our build out was too expensive for them to fund or for them to give us any money for. So we talked to our husbands and said, okay, let's, the four of us can do this. Let's haul out concrete on our own. Let's yeah, we you know, paint ourselves. And even for, you know, like we said about furnishing, um, we had a lot of used equipment and used um, trips to Goodwill. Yeah, Goodwill <laughs> stuff. We used just because it was like, well, hopefully someday we'll afford new, you know, it's not like we didn't take it serious, but we just didn't care that it wasn't new and shiny and fancy and somebody else was doing the work. We had to figure out how we could make it work for us. Mm -hmm. yeah, eventually what kept the bank you was going. Free. Yeah. What kept you going when you heard no, what, what had, yeah. what triggered in your mind to translate no into not yet? I don't think we we gave it an option. It was just not an option that we weren't going to open. I think we just told ourselves we were doing it. So we were going to figure out how we had to do it. And knowing that we couldn't come up with all the money, we could we could take everything I had out of savings or everything you know we had we could pull it together. We knew we didn't have enough. So so then okay, what can we shave where? What can we what can we do to make us look a little bit better to the bank and I also think Heidi's not giving herself enough credit. Um, I really could not have, I probably would have said no um, if it wasn't for her. I, I explain Heidi as she's the person in, in, in a, on a football team that pushes the, the person that's holding the ball to the end zone. She's the pusher. She's going to make it happen. And I honest truth, I don't think I could have done it. If somebody would have said no to me, by myself, I would have been okay. That stinks. But Heidi's passion really drove us, and my partnership with her. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could have done it like morally, like emotionally, or anything like that without her. And she is a pusher for sure. Well, it definitely helps having two people because I feel like when we, when I was told no, it wasn't just me personally. They were telling it was telling us. So then, so I could cry to her. She could cry to me. We could get angry about it. We could, you know. And then like, okay, now what? Now what are we going to do? You know? Yeah. Link arms. Yeah, right. Yeah, so there's there's blessing in partnerships. And then there's also challenges in partnerships. And I've talked a couple of times on my podcast to partners that were not siblings. And mm -hmm. how do they manage without losing a friendship? Because there's tough things that happen. And you don't always agree on what should happen next or the approach that should happen. So how have you guys managed to continue your strong bond as sisters and as, as best friends in this pursuit? What are some of your keys? Yeah. I think we both know what each other's strengths are and they are very different. You know, me with having the coffee experience and the love of really connecting with people. I was going to be a social worker. Then I found out I didn't have a backbone for that. That is, it's tough work. And I was like, okay, hey, what else can I do with people? Because I really want to be around people. Um, and yeah. Heidi's amazing, you know, talent she has with business and marketing and numbers. Like, so we play, we know where each other's strengths are. We never argue with each other. If we had, um, one is making a decision off of their strengths um, than the other. We just trust each other. We put a lot of trust, but mm -hmm. we also know what bush and bu buttons to yeah. press <laughs> and like what not to press because yeah. we know uh -huh. each other so well. I never have to question, is she going to get angry with this or upset and, mm -hmm. or make her happy, you know? So, and I think we know if there's something that we don't agree on, I think we have learned over the 10 years, if it is something, you know, I think we both know how to like internalize it and say, is this life changing or is this going to be, is this going to be business changing or do we, 
can we just, do we have to really argue about it? You know, is it, is it worth the argument? Like, fine, she knows better than I do. Let's just go with that because I'm not willing to argue about it. And it's not going to change the dynamic of our business really, you know, something small, like whether we add something to the menu or not, or something like that, you know, there's um something you said earlier too, that you, you talked about the translating the no into not yet. What would you say to someone who's listening today that has received a couple no's or has had someone really close to them, a family member, for example, a father, maybe a father or mother wasn't as supportive as your parents were, Mm -hmm. or um, a confidant that kind of gave them the look like, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, I call them dream crushers. Uh, People you share your dream with and they just, they just crush your dream. They don't necessarily do it intentionally. Um, maybe some of them do. What would you say to someone who's received those no's and is really sitting in this place of tension between they really want to do this and they're they're feeling like they should just give up? What would you say to them? Yeah. I would say I, I would first say you have to look inside yourself and dis- and decide whether or not your passion is really there. If you know you really want to do it and you really truly believe in your heart that you want it, it will it will happen. I, I truly believe and you cannot, you can't worry about what everybody else is saying or what, what, what even someone who's so important to you says, if you truly believe this is where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do, the doors will open. They may not open as we all hope they would. I mean, I would love for that first bank to have told us that like, yeah, great. Take <laughs> as much money as you want. You know, I mean, we would, we would have all new right. furniture, all new appliances, but um but I think it made us stronger. All those no's just pushed us. And then it also actually pushed us to open our eyes a little bit more because of course we went in with rose colored glasses at the beginning. Like we're going to do so well, we're going to be so successful. And so th- then we had to kind of like pull it back. Well, what if we weren't? Because they're telling us we're not going to be. Well, what if we weren't? How can we still be successful? How can we still make it work? Mm-hmm. And then we had to just, so we just had to keep looking at it and keep, I think you just got to p- keep pushing forward. You have to just keep your your eye to the goal that you have. And if that's your passion and that's what you know in your heart and you can feel it, if it's there, it's there. And you, you can feel that that's what you should be doing. Mm-hmm. The word that came to mind with both of you is um, commitment. Like you were, you were committed. There wasn't a, there wasn't like, ah, let's, let's try it out. Let's just see if it, no, you were, you were fiercely committed. Now, some people start their dream on a side hustle. They start their dream with experiments. They they test the waters for a while, and that, that's okay. That works too. But in your story, there was a, we're committed, and when we get the no, we're going to figure out how we're going to do this. We have to do this, so let's figure out how. And you move forward anyway yeah. with it. That's really, really good. So, I know the last two years have been a challenge, um, getting people together. You know, your business is built on community and getting people together. The last two years with COVID has been just um, just very difficult for all restaurants and all people industry, right, where people are gathering together. So that's got to be one challenge. Uh, I'd like you to talk about that challenge and how you met it. And how you adapted and how you move forward anyway through that. And I'd also want to open that up to what are some other challenges that you faced um, along the way? Yeah, uh, great question. So I guess, yeah, with the first most recent challenge, um, yeah, it was hard. Uh, we did close our doors right away um, in April. We didn't know um you know, what was all going on and what was the best decision to make as a, you know, business owner, as a community member, as a friend. Um, So we did close our doors for a couple of weeks, trying to figure everything out. Can I just interject really quick? The day that we decided to shut down and we shut down for six weeks and we didn't know obviously then how long it was going to be, but the day that we decided we were sitting in roots after close just crying, thinking about how this would affect not only obviously our customers, but our, our for sure our employees, us. Mm-hmm. You know how how would it how would it make a um, impact on our families? Mm-hmm. 
it was a really, really hard, hard decision, but and not one that we took lightly, but we knew that it was the best choice to make at the time. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and decision first, fatigue is real, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah. it is. It is. Mm. And, you know, never a thought that you would have to make that decision to close your doors and not knowing what the outcome was going to be. Are we going to reopen again? Or, you know, what, where does everybody else sit? I mean, our employees are our family mm. and we care about each and every one of them. And it was, it was hard. And then after the six weeks of processing how to safely open where we can still be a coffee shop and do what we need to do um, and complete our mission, but do it safely for our employees and for our customers. So the first um, phase, I mean, we had multiple phases mm-hmm. um, for throughout the year and a half, really. Oh, but um, the first phase was I pretty hate much that word no. I know, <laughs> I know. right? Uh, but it was just opening our front door and having a pickup window. So you're not really walking inside routes. It was just... They, we, it kicked mm. us in the butt to finally get our online ordering that we wanted at some point. And we're like, all right, now we're going to do this online ordering thing. Mm-hmm. And so we got us to do that. And it was so amazing just even having people pick up their coffee at the front door, mm. um, uh, how much joy it brought them. They would say, oh, you brought some routine back into my life. You brought some joy back. It was just, we were just thinking it was just a cup of coffee. You can't even come in, but they just, this is exactly what they needed and what we needed too at the time. And then, you know, I was just slowly starting to reopen a little bit more Mm -hmm. and a little bit more and a little bit more. But, you know, there was a time where we opened, but we still couldn't have anybody sitting inside. Um, was weird. This mm-hmm. is like, this is not, and we had to push them out. Like you can't stay too long. Like you have to stop the conversation right now. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to get going mm-hmm. it kind of thing was, was weird. It was not anything that we ever wanted to do to a customer yeah. or the feeling of a coffee shop of just not having that chatter. And it was, it was, it was depressing for and, sure. And I think too, over the last two years, embracing every customer's feelings and understanding that everybody's feeling a little bit different and some are, um, you know, feel, feel very, are very opinionated one way or the other, but then also some people have such a strong feeling on how, and, and, and it's affecting them in some, so many different ways. And I think actually that it's brought us closer to our customers, um, even in that short period of time where we couldn't even sit and talk to them, but just because we no matter what you you empathize and all of our employees just empathize for what everybody because we're all dealing with it and it's been such a um such an experience for us all to go through together and to be able to like realize that at the end of the day we may not all agree on everything the same but we all feel that what people are feeling we can all understand we can all we can all empathize with each other yeah that's a it's a global challenge isn't it yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of the other challenges that we've had, I would say, um, I mean, we've had other coffee shops open, like um, across the street or right, right down the road since we've been open. And at, at first we were like, you know, you take it as almost like, oh, this is competition. This is, this is going to be hard. What is this going to do to our business? But it's been a really, um, honestly, I think it's been positive. We've, we've made such great relationships with, with all of the downtown businesses that we, that we are um, around, which has been so great. Honestly, we all, you know. We, we borrow from each other. We help each other out when we need to. It's, it's mm-hmm. honestly been better than we thought, you know? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think, um, you know, another challenge, just like with any business owner, is that balance between life and work is always very hard. Mm-hmm. You know, when I when we opened the shop, I didn't have any kids. So it, I could be there 24-7. My husband was like, fine, I'll go fishing. You have fun at work. And I'm like, yeah, work. This is awesome. <laughs> and then I got had two little boys and trying to balance, okay, sh- should I go into work right now? And then I'm taking away from my family time or should I go home right now? And then I'm taking away from my work time. You know, that struggle is very real. But I think having and putting the trust into your employees is beyond soul, um, like healing mm-hmm. that the moment that we develop great relationships and we're okay, giving some of our, the responsibilities that we were doing over to other 
people and seeing their passion in doing this and, and us trusting mm-hmm. was the best thing I think we could have done for our families. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, you have to be okay being, you know, not a hundred percent or anymore. Like I have to be okay giving 75% at home or at work. Like there's, I can't have these unrealistic expectations of myself anymore and, and being okay with that. So. Mm-hmm. Any other uh, clues or little, um, principles of achieving some sort of balance between your personal life, your home life and Mm -hmm. launching a new business because it can be all consuming. Um, You said um, giving away work responsibility and trusting it to your team. That would be one principle. What are some others that have have helped you manage that? I would say knowing um, when you are home, being fully committed then to being present at home. That means maybe putting the phone aside. You can always check Mm. emails, check reviews that customers are leaving, um, and it can really affect you at home. But actually doing it in a place where you can be fully committed to that email or fully committed to that comment or phone call. And if it's not at home for you, then you have to be committed to take that on somewhere else. And that's where I, at home is not a good place for me to be, you know, half in, half out, you know, when, especially with my boys being so young and having to take care of them more. But I realize that having those boundaries for sure is very, it makes it easier. And being open with what those boundaries are to, you know, my sister or to, you know, other team members that like, Hey, just so you know, I might not be super present right now, you know? Um, but Mm -hmm. if you need somebody, here's somebody to go to or whatever, you know, I'd say, and I'd also say with that being, um, graceful with yourself, because I feel like that's, um, in reality, like, I think we all can say that, but it's so hard to do. And, and so, um, I, I feel like I tend to be someone who will beat myself up over like, oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this. I can tell my husband's looking at me like, why are you doing that right now? Um, and being graceful with myself, knowing that I, I am doing the best that I can in both areas. And it's never like Hillary said, it's never going to be a hundred percent in, in either area, but knowing that I, I'm still doing the best that I can. So I can be at work. And I know there's times where if I don't, I don't, I don't have to be there. Well, then I'm going to go home and I'm going to do something that's more productive at home because I have a flexible schedule. And so sometimes I, sometimes that is to a detriment where I have to be there at any given time. But then so if I, if I know I can put myself away when I need to, I'll do that. How do you, how do you um, remember your who? One of the things I say a lot in my dream accelerator is when we're, when we're in the grind and we're stuck and we've lost a little bit of the shine, a little bit of the joy. um, It's always, it tends to be the motivating factor to get back after it is the who, the who we're serving, the who our, our adventure is for. And you've mentioned a couple stories earlier on in our conversation about the individual that had the difficult family conversation there. Um, How do you intentionally remember your who? I love that. That's good. Um, I think it's sometimes um, taking a step back when it is like our busy times and seeing the place differently, not looking at the ticket right in front of you and maybe how many minutes that they've been waiting for their drink or sandwich, but like taking a step back and looking at the laughter that's going on, the amount of seats in the chairs at that moment. And um, those times are super important, but also being in there when it's sometimes completely quiet as well. And seeing the place a little bit differently of, well, this would be really scary if it was very quiet, or you see things that you appreciate because you missed it when it was busy as well. So taking those times away at those specific times in general, but I, I think too, I'm so sorry to interject. Um, I think too, that, you know, giving our, giving the space to all of our employees to get to know the customers a little bit, it helps so much when they know a little bit about what's going on, they share it with the other employees and it just gives you a, um, a more personal feel. 
you know, a customer, um, an older gentleman um, that was going on a blind date there. I mean, it, it gives us this and, and then seeing it unfold and us being able to be part of it and us being able to be there and witnessing it is it's just such a neat feeling that, first of all, that they're allowing us into that um, that memory in their life, you know. Um, but then, but then also, if, as long as we, the more we can get to know, the more we can personalize and make it. Each ticket isn't a ticket; it's a person that we now have gotten to know, and we get to know this experience with them. Mm-hmm. I think in the, in the coffee bars in a town like Economic lend itself to that very thing happening. It's not there's not a lot of drive by happening, and probably as mm-hmm. much as there is, this is a community center. Um, mm-hmm. We have a wine bar in in Verona where I used to live here in Madison area and in their bathroom, they have it's their walls are just covered with these pictures of people in the wine bar having a moment. Right. And so you can see visibly, do you guys do anything like that? Do you do anything visually in your, in your space Mm -hmm. to celebrate the people? That's a good, you know, I guess not so much with, um, pictures but we do I think more than just in our space because our mission for sure was to bring community into our 3,000 square foot space but also to bring a sense of community downtown Oconomowoc and not saying that it was never there Um, we probably being young just didn't appreciate it as much but we Heidi and I volunteer so many hours into creating a sense of community downtown, whether it's getting a relationship with the you know business owners downtown, we put in on a lot mm-hmm. of events um, that bring in just thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Fall Fest, um, these beer gardens, uh, Chili Fest, and that visually sometimes sums it up. Seeing mm-hmm. how busy our mm-hmm. shop is all the other shops are downtown and the village green of all these thousands of people coming out on something that we decided to just try to throw and plan and figure it out when we're there is a bit great visual for us for sure yeah. those days so are you, just like amazing because when you started it that was downtown economy walk was not a happening place yeah it was pretty dead I, down there I've driven through it in that time frame. I, I know it's like a uh, kind of walk. It's yeah. not that yeah, way not much now. happening. Yeah. No, it's not that yeah. way now. Yeah. It's yeah. actually, uh, Amy actually mentioned that the other night. My wife said, you know, I never knew a kind of walk had such a beautiful downtown area mm-hmm. and you guys have yeah, been a part of that. A yeah, yeah. They've really done a lot. When we moved into downtown, there was about 95% occupancy, um, Right, where you could you could pretty much get it. We 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 had our pick from which downtown that we wanted or um building. Yeah, building we wanted. And um yeah. it's definitely changed since mm-hmm. then. And they've done a lot of work. I mean, every every business owner, the, the city themselves have put so much work into you know the beautification and then and creating some spaces for people to to hang out, to be together, which is really neat. You know, like our whole back, you know, boardwalk, boardwalk area. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Um, space matters, place matters. And I applaud mm-hmm. you guys for your part in turning a community around and uh, giving it a new, fresh life. That's that's amazing. Your mission is being accomplished. You keep it up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I can't so wait much. to come and have a cup of whatever uh, in your, <laughs> and sandwich in, in roots sometime. Um, yeah, I can't wait. I want to give you an opportunity now uh, for my listeners who are you know, on various levels of their dream pursuit, what, what would you like to say to them to encourage them today? Just one thing you would think that would be encouraging. I would for sure just to, just to keep going, to keep going and to find either a mentor or a friend or someone to walk alongside you, to help you, to guide you. And even just to be your biggest cheerleader. I mean, that could be the best if you don't yeah. have a mentor or someone who's going to guide you into whatever business you're going into, just someone that's going to be cheering you on along the way. Cause it's going to be hard, but, it, but, the, but the reward is so much better. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yep. Don't give up. Just keep on pushing. If it's something that you feel very strong and passionate about, um, there's no arguing with that. So don't let your, you know, don't let your 
dreams say dreams, you know, don't let that no, just make it a not yet. I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. So um, how can people find out more about Roots, find out more about what you guys are up to in Economwalk? Um, well, you can find us on our website, rootscoffeebar.com or on Facebook or Instagram. Same. Um, you can, if you want to get a hold of Hillary or I, uh, we are always willing to mentor with people, talk with people, discuss, especially, you know, in this industry that we're familiar with. Uh, and that you can reach us at rootscoffeebar at gmail.com. Yeah, I love we're that. always thank up for, for discussion. Thank you for offering that. That, that means a lot because you can provide great encouragement to some people that have a heart centered dream, just like yours and uh, need a little bit of a push. Yeah. From absolutely. a, from a lineman pushing the running back. <laughs> that lineman. The- that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lineman. That's the word. Oh, uh, I know it's some position. <laughs> oh my gosh. You guys are so great. Thank you for, taking the time to be with me today and to share your lives with, with my audience. And uh, we're so grateful for your position in your community, uh, making a difference. Thank you, thank you um, so much. We need a lot more of that in our world. And I'm, I'm really proud of you for doing it. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. That Jeff. means really so it. much to us. And thank you so much for just allowing yeah. us to spend time with you today. This was great. I'm yeah. so glad that there's people like you out there pushing others as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. Thank Thank you you too. too. Hey, fellow dreamer. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Head over to my website, jeffmeyer.org for all of the show notes and links. And when you're ready to move from overthinking about your dream to actually taking action on it, consider joining the Dream Accelerator community. Our clients are getting crystal clear on their dream with our Dream Generator Vivid Description 5-Step Process. They're discovering the truth about fear and how to use it as fuel to take courageous steps in the right direction. And most importantly, they are walking a clear path forward because they have made an investment in themselves to confidently realize their dreams. The results are so inspiring. Having coaching and companions on the dream journey is crucial. Remember, fear will come, fear will stay. Move forward anyway.